have our um, panelists, and uh, as I introduce them, if you uh, have any questions that you would like to have included in the conversation, um, members of the documentary discussion series will be coming around soon with um, little cards and pens so you can write down your questions. Alrighty, welcome, please. Uh, Mary Ellen Novak. She is an organizer for Gays Against Guns and Rise and Resist. Since November 2016, Mary Ellen has developed and produced actions such as, oh, and there's so many. She'll, she'll tell us about some of her really cool actions and events and rallies that she has organized. And she's also participated in several disobedience actions throughout New York City and DC to amplify the need for more people to get involved in social justice issues. Mary Ellen works at Columbia University, she earned her MS in Negotiation and Conflict Resolution and is currently pursuing another MS degree, this time in Strategic Communication. Welcome, Mary Ellen. Thank you. Please, next, welcome Erin. What's Erin's name? I can't see it. Erin, thank you. Erin Fuller Bryan. Um, on October 1st, 2017, Erin's life changed forever when gunshots rang out at the concert in Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, she was attending with her husband, Chris. Uh, four months later, after the Parkland shooting in February 2018, Erin became a gun violence prevention activist when she realized she could no longer sit idly by while innocent people are murdered on a daily basis. She started telling her survivor story in hopes of motivating others to join the fight and joined Brady United Against Gun Violence and as, uh, as the co-president of the Westchester chapter. She speaks at walkouts, rallies, vigils, and marches and meets with elected officials on the issue of gun safety. Together with motivated young New Yorkers, she founded Team Enough New York, a youth gun safety advocacy organization to harness the power of the youth voice in New York State, and she serves as the group's advisor. Please welcome Erin fuller Bryant. Last but certainly not least, please welcome Catherine Showalter. She is the Westchester local group leader for Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. She has been involved in gun sense advocacy for four years and has held leadership positions in the Westchester Moms Demand Action Group for the past three. Catherine is experienced in, uh, as a publishing executive who worked in that industry for over 30 years. She cares deeply about eradicating gun violence in this country and is proud of her advocacy work for change in America's gun laws and culture. Please welcome Catherine. Okay, so um, as uh, you're getting ready with your questions, I'm going to ask all of our panelists to uh, kick us off with something pretty broad. Um, and let me make sure your microphone is on. And you see how close I'm holding it to my mouth. You have to hold it pretty close, kind of uncomfortably close, unfortunately. Um, but we want to make sure that everybody can hear the conversation. So uh, this film talked a lot about background checks and actions that need to be taken at a state and federal level. Um, but we're all just individual people. So um, what is something that an individual can do that really does make a difference in addressing this big concern? Excellent question. So I'm going to give you two numbers right now that are really important. So the first one is actually two, two slash. Uh, the first one is 34,852. That's the number of deaths that took place before the movie took started and I looked again right as I was sitting down and the number is 34,853 so one person died while we were watching this movie by a gun so the 34,852 let me explain that is the number of people who have died by gunshot wounds this year alone in the movie it said 32,514 I don't remember when it was they were interviewed at that time but just think about it that that number has uh, already been surpassed, and we haven't even hit the year. We have a lot more left. So those are a few numbers, but that's that one category. The other number I'm going to give you is 917-497-1725. Uh, thank you very much. I think you're pulling out your, number, your phone. Hopefully you're going to text me. You're going to call me. Uh, again, I'm going to keep saying this number over and over tonight. It's 917-497-1725. I can see all of you. Uh, so that's how you can get involved. Uh, coming here is fantastic, but I'm also going to push back and say that uh, thank you for coming, thank you for this wonderful opportunity, but 
you have to step up and you have to call me and you have to text me and I will tell you about all of our meetings and I will tell you how to get involved. 917-497-1725. Uh, Mariel, we can also put it on our social media and include it in our follow-up email. I want them to text now. I average oh. <laughs> two people every time. Oh, I very good. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So I, I also want to thank you all for coming and your interest in this topic because it's going to take all of us fighting to make this change. Um, as Mary Ellen said, there's 100 people that die of gun violence every day in this country, and that just keeps going up. And we have some states like New York that have terrific gun laws. We have other states that have almost no gun laws. So we do really need this at a federal level. And we can say that, well, we're in New York. We have uh, senators and Congress pe uh, people that su support uh, good gun le legislation. What can we do? Well, we don't have all, you know, everybody on the Congress side, but our organization, Moms Trans Action for Gun Sense in America, has chapters in all 50 states. And one of the things that we do is when we have some of our volunteers uh, from places like New York, when they had an election recently in Virginia, we will do phone calls into Virginia to try to educate people there about why this is important, how to talk to, you know, vote for the people that will pass good gun legislation, and that actually just happened in Virginia. And what was really heartening about that is we found out that actually that was the number one thing that voters cared about in Virginia was gun violence. And that, that was, you know, it was driving them to the polls. And they made a difference and they changed the legislation. But we do need this at a federal level. And Mitch McConnell is sitting on the background check bill because it's been passed. In, it, uh, once the, um, the House turned over, they passed a whole bunch of great laws and they're not going anywhere, unfortunately, with the Senate. So it's our voice, it's electing the people that are gonna do what we want them to do, and we need to get that through across the country. If, if I could just chime in before Aaron, um, because there's something relevant to what you just said, Catherine. For all of us who live in New York, if you're a New York State voter, for the first time this year, you were able to early vote. One of the really great things about early voting in New York means that you are available on election day to go elsewhere or in the days right before the election to go to some of the states and the districts where there are some really tight races. So if, if you want to be an activist right around the election time, you have 10 different days when you can vote in New York State now. So it gives you a little more flexibility if you want to travel to Pennsylvania, you want to travel to Virginia during the election time. Um, we were talking about how to get involved I just have an interesting tidbit about myself. Um, I actually grew up five minutes from Sandy Hook Elementary School. Um, so my life was already affected by gun violence in 2012. Our community was shattered. Um, it was it was just, and it was the day after my birthday too. Um, it was just awful. And I did a couple things, you know, I donated, I did a walk, I did some stuff, but I didn't do much, and I didn't get involved. Um, I don't know why. I don't know if I didn't know what my options were, or if I thought that what I did wouldn't matter, but I didn't. I didn't do anything. And then maybe somewhere in the back of my mind, I figured, hey, gun violence has already hit my community. I'm good. Lightning doesn't strike twice. Um, and then October 1st, 2017 happened. Um, so I decided I, I had to get involved. I couldn't sit around anymore and do nothing. Um, and that's something that I like to tell people. Um, you don't have to wait for gun violence to affect you personally to get involved. Um, a lot of the great activists out there, they, they have been personally affected, but I personally don't think it's extraordinary that I'm a gun violence prevention activist. Like, why wouldn't I be? I think it's extraordinary that normal people that have not been affected by gun violence become activists and get involved. To me, that is so much more powerful and so much more meaningful. Um, so I urge you to join your local chapter here of Moms to Me in Action or um, Breed United Against Gun Violence, or if you're a youth or have children who are students, they can join my organization, Team Up. But do something, if you don't have time, Donate money to one of your favorite groups, but don't wait for it to happen to you.
Thank you so much. And also, I just want to call to folks' attention. Um, if you didn't notice on your way in, on your way out, take a look at the tables because we have some um, some clings and some information from some of the organizations that are here today. Um, and I have a card from an audience member. It's not exactly a question, but I'll put it out there and maybe you can comment on um, uh, actions like this that might be effective. Uh, it's uh, Thank you, Bob. It says, uh, let's call Congress people after each shooting with this message. Of course, that could happen frequently. Um, your oldest child was 212 miles from the shooting. Your middle school child was X number of miles from the shooting. Your mother was X number of miles. Your wife was X number of miles. Um, essentially being trying to tie it very personally to the family members of uh, the people who are really making the decisions and, the, and not allowing these, this legislation to pass. Is that an effective approach? So I do that in letters all the time, not that specifically, but I do try to bring emotion into it. I feel like bringing emotion into it is way more effective. So when I write letters to senators or state senators or somebody who's opposing the legislation that we're urging, I always start with my story and then say, imagine that I was your daughter going through Imagine you getting a phone call at 1.05 a.m. on the East Coast time that the gunshots would not stop. And I try to bring some emotion into it. I get typically very nice replies back, um, but they still typically say, you know, um, I haven't been met with a lot of pushback when I do that. They always say we're very sorry for what you went through, but um, I don't know, it's somewhat effective maybe? Well, I think it's always effective to let your Congress, the people that you elect know how you feel, even the ones that are supportive of these bills. We will call Chuck Schumer and tell him that we, you know, the more people that call and tell him that this is an issue, he, it's good for his office to hear that. but. Unfortunately, what we've heard is that calling into other districts, if you're not um, a constituent, is not super helpful. That's why we've developed this tool to actually be able to call into other districts and get those people to either call their Congress people or senators or you know, educate them before an election is coming up. And we found that that's fairly um, you know, effective. And I think as Aaron said, Hearing survivor stories is always effective. And just like, I mean, that film was amazing, and I think, you know, it really, it hits you, you know, what these people have to go through. And then this, these people that are living with these injuries and the people that were responsible for it barely, you know, not much happens to them, or the, like the guy that sold the gun. So it's, it's pretty disheartening. But we just have to keep fighting for it, and I think that voting is the big thing. You know, we have to vote them out. Just to follow up, one of those letters I wrote to New York State Senator um, in Northern Westchester, I got a nice reply back. He was up for re-election last November, so I volunteered for the um, person running against him. I canvassed for him, I got very involved in his campaign, and we voted him out, and we voted uh, Pete Parkman. Well, yeah, just, I'm sorry, ma'am, no, pass okay, this to me. Yeah, one other thing, just, kind of goes along with that, because I also worked on that campaign as well. A bunch of my organization also helped out with um, with that. And we had a problem in New York. I mean, we had all these uh, laws that had been passed by the Assembly, and the New York State Senate would not pass them, because it was majority Republican. I hate to say that, but that's, that was the case, because it shouldn't be partisan. And we had IBC members that were caucusing with the Republicans and they would not let any bills go through. And we met with these, we were up there every year meeting with legislators, taking survivors with us to tell their stories. But once we flipped that, it was a big objective of ours was to flip the Senate and they passed nine bills uh, alone just this year. And it's, it's amazing the difference of that. Thank you. Uh, that's fantastic. I love that suggestion very much. Um, and I'm going to bring that back uh, to my group and amplify it. Uh, thank you, whoever suggested that. 
the other thing is uh, making these stories stick as far as uh, personalizing it is very important. Uh, to bring my academic uh, perspective here, there's an excellent book, it's by Chip Heath, and it's called Make It Stick. Uh, and it's, it addresses the issue as far as taking these stories and uh, having them basically, again, stick with you uh, when you leave the room. And I can just tell you that I'm averaging maybe about 130 seats are in this auditorium. And just, again, taking that number that I was talking about, which is the 84,523, did I, no, no. What was the number? Yeah, okay. Uh, but on average, you'd need to fill this auditorium 268 times. So uh, that would, that's the equivalent of the number of people who have passed away from gunshot wounds or, you know, to date. So that's a story that will stick with you uh, 268 times the next time you're here. And I never had a personal story, Erin, to your point. Um, I've never been affected personally through gun violence, but I saw the need to step up and to do something. Uh, I don't have school-age children. Uh, my child served in the Army. Uh, he is now 29. And, uh, but the other thing is, yes, definitely vote. Vote them out. Uh, campaign uh, for the people that you want to win, uh, against the people that you uh, don't want to win. But then also be a researcher. Text me and uh, research. Help us figure out how we can get around the Second Amendment. We need communications professionals. We need event planners because when we put together our demonstrations, we need to know uh, and access maybe a caterer, maybe some other uh, resources. So what can you do? I don't know. What can you do? Uh, but I will tell you, everything you can do will help. Any capacity. Uh, the one uh, victim in the movie, she has a lot of issues with regard to affording uh, pharmaceutical and medical. Uh, that's another area. Do you work in that particular area? Can you help us with that, um, that particular need? So I don't know. I don't know what you can do, but we can do something together and we can do a lot together. And the other thing is to keep pushing and to keep getting into their faces. Those buildings that they were showing them visiting, uh, Russell Hall and Long, um, uh, I'm forgetting the dates, yes. Uh, those are open to you and I've gone into those halls quite a few times and when the doors are closed, I knock and I open them. And I go in there and I talk to the representatives uh, with a lot of people as well in different capacities and you have to keep going there. You have to keep talking to them. And you have to also visit the offices where they actually do work. And that's another thing that I do, is uh, go in there with a group of people and we sing songs and we thank them. Uh, it's to the, uh, to the tune of Mr. Sandman. And we sing, representative, thank you, blah, blah, blah. I won't sing it all now, but uh, there are lots of different facets to uh, activism. And again, uh, please get involved. Another question. Um, the movie did not mention assault rifle bans. Can you expand on the assault rifle ban legislation? Yes, I mean, definitely, because what happens is you ban a certain type of weapon and the gun manufacturers find another one that gets around that law. So you constantly have to be looking at that. And one of the things now is, th is 3D printing. So people are able to actually make their own guns. And there is a law now in New York that bans 3D uh, printable guns, which is great. We certainly could use that on a national level. And now we have to worry about the different parts of the gun. So there's, we actually have a, there's something that's going through now that's gonna ban you even printing like a piece of a gun because the law currently is just the whole gun. So then people are getting around that by saying, oh, well, print the receiver piece and then I'll get you know the other piece somewhere else. So, so we have to just keep on top of that and it's really important. I don't think the, legislate, you know, the legislation can just stay as it is. I mean, if you've seen from the history of the film, things change and we have to really react to that uh, as, as things change. Uh, so my organization, Team Enough, and um, Brady United Against Gun Violence, um, we do believe that there should be an assault weapons ban. Um, another uh, kind of difficulty in that is that uh, the definition of an assault weapon is very broad, and we have to, 
I mean, the language in the bill alone, it has to have um, three certain types of criteria, scope, uh, it, it's, I mean, I don't want to bore you. But um, what people will say is, well, the, it only has two feet, so it's not, it's not an assault weapon. Okay, so we have to really nail out that language, and that gets really hard when you're trying to have a dialogue with somebody about this. And um, I've had, I, I try to engage. I feel like with people who are pro-gun, pro-Second Amendment and everything, at the end of the day, we can agree on something. Usually it's background checks. Um, so I have conversations with people, and the tactic that always happens is they, they argue about what constitutes an assault weapon. I saw the carnage that assault weapons do. I, I witnessed that. I heard it. The, the, the gunshots were so rapid that I thought it was a helicopter because it was, it was firing so steadily and not stopping, and it lasted 11 minutes. You can't do that with a normal gun, with a handgun. You, you, you can only do that with a semi-automatic assault weapon. 18 of them, actually, with bump stocks. That shouldn't be legal. Um, actually, you know, I, 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 sometimes this is this gets to be a very personal issue, so um, we just were, we're hesitant to hand the microphone around. But if you just want to, if you can just instead of telling too much of your own story, if you can just ask a question. Yeah, I, I guess the question I have is that I don't understand assault assault weapons and why people want them. I can't for hunting animals or hunting deer or ducks, whatever, you don't use an assault rifle. For protecting your home is the last thing you're gonna use is an assault, assault rifle. So the only thing that I can gather, and, and I guess my question is, can you tell me, other than it's fun, and I like to just shoot out my backyard and do whatever, or I'm afraid of the government ultimately coming against me, and so we need it ultimately for that day, is there any other reason why anyone would want to be in favor of assault rifles? I can't think of one, but I think, you know, if you were to talk to the NRA, they'd have probably have a whole bunch of them. Mm -hmm. And there are people that, there are those that feel that there shouldn't be, you know, I don't want, I want to be able to own any kind of gun that I want to own and do whatever I want to do with it. But as, as they said in the film, there's the rest of us that have to, you know, want to be protected. So, yes, it's fun, it's whatever it is, but uh, the other thing is, uh, I've done a lot of actions. Uh, let me take a step back. Bees Against Guns is the group that I represent, and we're an inclusive direct action group of LGBTQ and allies. And uh, we do a lot of work that uh, breaks, it, the goal is to break the gun industry's chain of death. And what, what I mean by that is the gun manufacturers, the investors, the complicit and the corrupt politicians, anybody who basically steps in front of the uh, objective to have safer gun laws. And with that direct action, uh, one, of the, one of the actions that we did was to go into a gun show. So I went, I, I tend to be the one that does a little bit more uh, edgy stuff, which uh, Ted Cruz, I actually disrupted him in the middle of a hearing, so that was really fun. But in any event, this is a story for another time, but in any event, the gun show, so we went in there um, undercover, and I tried to purchase a gun, whatever, whatever, but wow, it's, uh, it's intoxicating, and just walking around and watching everybody, and the gun shows, it's real, what they were showing in the, in the, uh, in the movie. Uh, you see the fashion aspect of it, or you see the uh, sports of it, or you see all of these amazing things that you never even knew existed. And it's enticing and, again, intoxicating. And they're all over the place. Uh, so walking around there, it's kind of this whole environment where you get swept up. I personally didn't, but you get swept up into this uh, community feeling, into this feeling of empowerment, uh, and it's also uh, camaraderie. So yeah, fun, and that's something, but there's also all other kinds of emotions. Think about the preview that we saw for the other movie with the cell phones. Uh, it's a thing, and when these kids are looking at these things, they're like, oh my gosh, this phone, this is fantastic. Or Facebook, I gotta go onto Facebook. Uh, everybody else is on there. 
it's the same type of mentality. It's just like, that's something that I want. And oh, look over here. That's something else that I want. And just having those di dialogues with other people, it's, again, intoxicating and you want more and more. So I, I kind of called an audible in the middle of the discussion. No, it's okay, Donna, I'll walk up. I kind of ca called an audible in the middle of our conversation because this is a little bit of a shorter one where you do have a little more time. So um, if I hand you the mic, then um, please uh, try and um, keep your questions concise. My name is Donna Hannon. I am a resident of the village of Briarcliff Manor in the town of Austin. I'm also Jewish. Hi. <laughs> There's a few, uh, few more congregants here. Um, so for the last few years, I've noticed with tremendous dismay, every time I sit in synagogue, especially on the high holidays, men who are wearing suits that fit funny, walking around behind the ark where the Torahs are kept, just wandering around. And I'm thinking, that's very rude. One day it dawned on me, they're not congregants. They're security. We had armed men, mostly men, I'm not sure if there were any women, in our synagogue. So going back to some of the points that were made about sharing your stories, if you unfortunately were a victim or involved in a shooting, how effective would it be to share the situation that I'm sure our synagogue is not the only one in the United States. In fact, I know it's not, because synagogues share their, their situations, what they're doing um, to to protect themselves. Um, I know that we've had active shooting drills in our synagogue with local police in Westchester County. Um, they've commended us for being so prepared. That's kind of a scary notion, isn't it? How much good would it do to share with just the general public, um, our Congress people, to imagine what it would be like on Christmas sitting in their, in their church? With, surrounded by security guards, because what if? The other side of that, and I'll wrap this up, our children have attended school. My daughter, you know, she's 22. She's, she, know, she knows nothing other than active shooter drills, lockdowns. I remember, you know, sitting in the hall, practicing for nuclear fallout drills and things like that. Um, but that was so far. That was really not something that, you know, we gave much mind to. Again, what would be the effect if we required people to participate in active shooting drills so that they could be prepared? Make it the reality for them if they haven't been through a situation for real. How effective would that be? Well, I think that, um Certainly, we're traumatizing our children. There's no question about that, having to go through these drills. In fact, our, uh, every time Gun Safety, which is our parent organization, is doing a study about this, because I think there's some question as to how effective this is, and is it harming our children more than it's really helping them. But you're right, having people understand what the world we've created for our children it means people need to understand that, that this is the effect of all this. And the same thing with your synagogue and other synagogues and other churches of places that used to be safe places where you came to worship or you came to be entertained, as in the case in Las Vegas, and you felt safe being there, and now you don't feel safe. And that's, it's a terrible statement about, about where things are, and um, you shouldn't have to worship with armed security guards. But unfortunately, they're trying to keep they're trying to keep you safe because of these incidents that have happened. I mean, I do think that if you look at the statistics, the everyday gun violence, which happens in urban areas, city gun violence, that is a bigger thing than the mass shootings. But we hear about the mass shootings, and they have there have been more of them, and they're really tragic and and very upsetting. But there's communities that have to deal with gun violence and. They talk a little bit about New Orleans every single day. Uh, what you were saying is uh, phenomenal, and it gave me an idea, which I'll talk about in a second. But uh, every time that there's a fire drill, uh, or not a fire drill, just uh, a 
fire marshal or somebody comes up and uh, to our floor, wherever I work, I'm sure this might happen to you as well. Uh, and they'll explain, this This is the fire exit, that's where you exit, uh, pull the alarm, all these other things. And they'll tell you, and they turn around and say, are there any questions? And uh, I wait, and uh, for everybody asks the appropriate questions, and I try and be the last one to say, yes, when's the active uh, shooting drill? Do you do those here? and everybody takes a pause and it's extremely uncomfortable but it's extremely necessary and that's something that all of us can do so the next time they say uh we're going to gather in the hallway and we're going to talk about the fire drill and everything okay thank you but what's the active shooting drill and again uncomfortable but you have to push the envelope and you have to really get people to have it in their heads this the idea again making it stick I'm going to go back to my desk and say, oh, wait a minute, what do I do if that happens? Because yes, it can happen to you. And what you were talking about as far as uh, taking that story, and the next time that I do go down to DC, or the next time it happens, uh, just to go into those halls when I meet with the representatives and say, hey, what's your active shooting uh, plan? What do you, what, what idea, where is your exit? And ask the representatives there. Because after I leave, that take, that leave behind is going to stick with them. And even though the representatives might not be able to vote because they're owned by the NRA and blah, 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 they'll hopefully try and have that into their head as well. So thank you, that was a great idea, two great ideas tonight. And a couple of you texted me, so thank you. Just um, let folks know about our experience here. I work in um, Village Hall, and just this Monday, I was telling Catherine, we were having our active shooter drill for 16 Curtin Avenue, which is where the Village and Town Municipal Building is. Um, they, they've done it for all of the municipal buildings, and all the staff is asked to come, and so I now know how to unlock, and that I'm capable of opening the window in the board meeting room, and it's on the first floor, I could jump up, but I'd never thought that through before. We, we don't do it often enough, at least not for elected officials. This is my first time in seven years. Um, but the police lieutenants who did it for us, they've also done it for the schools, they've done it for the school, the educators, and for the staff as well, and, and as well as other entities throughout the community. So we have a pretty active training availability here in Austin, um, and uh, I know our police department and others are available. They have a, a certified program, and I forget exactly what it's called, but it's, you know, the avoid, deny, defend, and, and I learned all of that. Um, and so if you are part of an organization or in a building that wants to bring that kind of training into your um, organization, then I would encourage you to reach out to the Austin Police Department if you're local. These are great ideas about using the political process and we should not stop working on that. But I wonder if any of you know people who are trying to use the economic process. So, the millennials, many of whom don't buy things, they rent things, service on demand, call Lyft, call Uber, don't have an exercise bike in your thing, belong to a cheap health club. So my question is, could some, could you imagine some organization for people who like to use guns for legitimate purposes, like hunting, saying, we're gonna have a franchise system, just like there's Dunkin' Donuts and there's Starbucks. Get the check with us once. Anytime you need a weapon, they, they would then own the weapons. Therefore, they could be smart weapons, which only fire for the person they're given to. Only fire when their pulse is in a range that indicates that they're not like delusionally schizophrenic or whatever. So anyway, my real question, uh, that's my dream, but the question is, how do we harness entrepreneurs and the economy so that 30 years from now, we're not having the same discussion like we passed a good law in 2021, but then the gun industry innovated around it. Like, I don't want to play cat and mouse for the next 100 years. So what are your thoughts? Is anybody working in that space? Yes, yes, I'm so excited. Uh, so again, I need you, I need people who are finance backgrounds. Uh, so not only to help us process our 501c3 applications, which just goes beyond my 
reasoning, but who can actually figure out how to hit them in the wallets. Uh, we are working, Hayes against Guns, we're working on a Wells Fargo campaign. Uh, Wells Fargo is the bank of the NRA, so if you bank through them, fine. Uh, I'm not suggesting that you take all your money out of there. Wow, that would be great. Uh, just don't go to the use their ATM. Uh, that's one little step in that direction. But yes, finance, Wells Fargo is the NRA's uh, bank of choice, and the less that we do business with them, uh, the better, but then also if you want to get involved or to help as far as figuring out that financial piece, again, finance experts, events, caterers, communications experts, we need you, so brilliant. So a couple, I think that's an interesting idea for sure, and definitely things that would be good to look at. The one thing I will I'll tell you an anecdotal story, which was that and I'm probably not going to get this all exactly right, but I think one of the gun manufacturers had actually manufacturers had developed a system so that there was a fingerprint or a smart gun so that it only could be used by that owner. And the NRA went after that manufacturer so badly that they almost went out of business they might have. It was terrible. So that that's part that has been part of the problem. The other part of the problem is that you can't, right now, we're trying to get this changed as well, you can't sue gun manufacturers. You can sue anybody else that develops a product that is harmful or dangerous, but you can't. They've protected the gun manufacturers. So those are the those are the challenges on that. I don't follow um, the legislation or um, the, the judicial component of this, but I, I think I had recently heard that the Supreme Court would be hearing a case involving one of the major gun manufacturers with regard to whether or not they had any sort of implication or involvement in one of the um, recent shootings. Is that the case? Yeah, yeah um, the Sandy Hook victims brought that case forward. I believe it, um, last week or the week before um, yeah and it 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 passed so um, I'm sure there's going to be a legal battle back and forth for a while but yes they're trying to set precedent it's Remington right? yeah, so, yeah. If, if I could if I, oh, I'm sorry go ahead. No, go ahead I just wanted to jump in with the um, uh, in response to what Bob had said and what we can do other than gun legislation. Um, the reason why the NRA is so powerful, or big pharma is making it impossible for that woman to be able to afford her pharmaceuticals, is because we don't, because all of the uh, elected officials at the federal level are dependent on campaign donations from major lobbying organizations. And it really goes back to that. I mean, that's why they couldn't get past the filibuster, because the NRA came in and told our elected officials how to vote, because they're so powerfully biased. So really, the solution to sensible gun legislation and, and every other ill of our country is real campaign finance reform. And that's going to take true, true leadership like we have not seen in a generation. But that is truly what we should all be working for, whatever group you're most involved with as an activist. Yes, it was before. I was uh, confused. There's another Supreme Court case that's taking place in December 2nd, which I'm going down to D.C. If anybody else, you're more than welcome to. Look at how much fun I am. We're going uh, December 1st through December 4th, uh, Ace Against Guns. And on uh, December 2nd, it's uh, the New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus New York, New York, New York. This one, yeah, this one's very, very important. I just need a couple seconds, extra seconds. Uh, Whatever the decision is, it's basically uh, taking your gun. May I have your attention, please? The library will be closing in a half hour. Please note that the computers will be shutting down in about 15 minutes. Please save all your work. Great. Uh, so the 
issue is that uh, people have to have their gun in a box so that when they go to other areas, uh, they are safely traveling with the gun uh, if they want to go to a fire uh, range or something like that. And so now that's basically, I'm really badly paraphrasing that, but that's basically the issue um, that's taking place. Uh, what I'm thinking ahead is a bill that has been introduced quite frequently, it's S-69, and that's the Concealed Carry Reciprocity Act. And so what that means is that it's in the Senate, it's just hanging out there. Uh, but what that basically, this federal Senate, not the state, and so what that basically means is that, uh, let's say you are from a state such as Nevada or another place that was represented in those, the uh, pipeline, the uh, iron pipeline, for example, Florida, and then you are traveling to New York, uh, which has much stricter uh, gun laws. Uh, you are, if the bill passes, you are able to take that gun and uh, bring it to New York, and New York has to, uh, reciprocity, they have to say, okay, we're going to uh, let you carry or uh, have an open carry uh, weapon, whatever the law is in Florida. So imagine that you are at your park with your child or you're going to Starbucks and you have a person, and I might be exaggerating a little bit, but basically this is the theme, is that you have your, or you're waiting in line and there's somebody with their assault rifle slung on their back, or they have, uh, in New York City where I'm from, they have their gun in a holster uh, on the subway. I mean, just think about that mental picture of that and uh, or if and because I work at uh, Columbia University uh, I also think about it if I'm a student or uh, if they're sitting in a class and there is a person am I going to get into a critical thinking experience and a debate with another student who I know is carrying a gun because they are from Nevada am I going to be a professor and give you a F or a B minus or an A minus on your uh, paper when I know that you have a gun. So these are things to consider and think about. Um, the reciprocity, so it's the concealed carry reciprocity and it would pass, but it also is uh, something to keep on your radar as far as December 2nd, uh, this particular court case that's going to take place in the Supreme Court. I think the court case um, on December 2nd has to do with trying to weaken, it's, it's a way to try to get around right. New York State gun laws. But the good news about concealed carry reciprocity is that we did, we fought very hard when we were worried that that was going to get somewhere. And that's all but dead right now. It could come back. But right no, now it's, it's, still it's, it's legislation. Yeah, but there, it's, it's the from, uh, maybe from a discussion afterwards yeah. instead of referring to Yeah, yeah. no, <laughs> anyway. But I mean, it, but the point is, like, all these organizations fought really hard to stop that from getting going any further and made phone calls into other states and all kinds of stuff because it's a terrible, it's a terrible, terrible law. So yeah, we don't want that. But we also, our organization is going down to uh, for the December second um, case as well. So there'll be a lot of people down there um, supporting uh, better gun legislation. I was just going to say, since we're talking about open carry, a lot of people don't realize that in open carry states, you can open carry on college campuses. Mm -hmm. yeah. And a lot of people don't realize that. <coughs> it's something we talk about when you, you know, you, it's something to consider when you're sending your children to school. Do you want them in a state where kids are allowed to have guns on campus? And there's a lot of them. So it, there is actually, I think, a website, and I'm forgetting the name of it, that will tell you you know, what those states are and what those schools are. Because some schools also have their own rules, and even if they're in a state that's got open carry, they don't allow it on campus. But it's something that, keep guns off campus, okay. I see, I see we have quite a couple of questions for people who have asked questions. Is there anyone who hasn't asked a question that wants to have an opportunity? Here I'd just like to know if, if you could tell us a little bit about what the status of the, the, the Attorney General of New York about the murder insurance Insurance. Well, it has to do, I don't know a lot about it, but you know, the Attorney General is going to look at the NRA's insurance policies oh, where somebody owns a gun and they'd be insured in case they shoot somebody. Uh, I don't know. 
I don't know where that is exactly. I have, I, I do know that they're looking into it against, there's a whole bunch of stuff, legislation that I think the New York Attorney General is, is going after the NRA for amongst other people. I mean, the NRA has been severely weakened in the last number of years uh, for all kinds of reasons. So that's a good thing. And we just have to keep fighting, you know, for all the nonsense legislation. <coughs> To, uh, to continue on this, uh, this idea of um, legislation. Um, elsewhere in Asimu, there are speakers talking about how um, if I host a party and somebody brings alcohol and gets drunk and does something terrible, I'm responsible. Even if I didn't supply the alcohol, but it happened on my property. Why can't we take that legislation and transfer it over? The, um, the idea that uh, the AG of New York is trying to make the NRA responsible um, insurance-wise. How about private homeowner's insurance? Um, I don't think I've ever been asked by a, an insurer if I have a gun on my property. Shouldn't I be responsible and have insurance for that? So I think we need to push that legislation too. Yeah, that's a really good suggestion. Uh, we do have now a safe storage um, law in New York, and that's a whole other aspect of things where um, we need people that have guns to keep them safe in their homes and, and keep the ammunition away from the gun and the gun locked up. And we do a lot of education to parents to say, you really should ask before your child goes on a play date if people have guns, and if they do, are they stay safely stored? Because that's another huge problem where parents think their guns are put away, the kid doesn't know where they are, and there's a lot of accidents that happen because kids are curious, and it's not, it's not them, it's the people that own the gun's responsibility. And what I don't know is if there were to be a situation where a child got a hold of a gun in New York State, and the parents had not practiced safe storage, uh, is there, you know, would they be liable? I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Um, so, I know a woman named um, Kristen Song, she's from Connecticut, um, her son Ethan, uh, accidentally killed himself. He was playing at a friend's house um, and the friend's father had an un unsecured firearm in the home. Um, they were posing with the guns, taking pictures and putting them on Instagram and they didn't realize it was loaded. Um, he killed himself. He was, uh, I think, a sophomore in high school. Um, and Kristen and her husband are fighting on a federal level. They first started in Connecticut to pass a bill named after their son called um, Ethan's Law. And Ethan's law would require just what Catherine was saying, that um, if that happened, that father should have been responsible. In Connecticut, they brought him to trial, and he was found not guilty. He did not, they couldn't prove that he stored the gun loaded. There was no evidence, there was no way to prove that the bullets were in the gun. So even though nothing was locked up, if the gun and the bullets were stored separately, he would have been following Connecticut law. So um, she's fighting for that on a federal level. I think everyone should urge you know, their representatives to also sign on to that on a federal level. Um, as Catherine was saying, we just did pass safe storage this year in New York. Another thing um, to think about that doesn't often get talked about is gun suicide. Um, adolescents typically, I don't know the exact statistics, I'm not a, 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 a professional on this, but um, they decide they're going to kill themselves and they try within the next, I think it's 20 minutes. They, they, it's very fast. It's an impulsive decision. Um, if you use a gun, guns are very lethal, right? If you try another method, I don't know the statistics exactly, but um, the chances that it's successful in another method are much lower than if it's successful if you use a gun. And the statistics, which Catherine's going to pull up, also show that in that case, if, a, if an adolescent uses a gun to try to commit suicide, it comes from their home. And they know how to get it. And it wasn't locked up, or they knew the code to the safe. Um, and that's why safe storage is so extremely important. That's why the biometric locks would also be great, because it would only be the parent or the owner of the gun who could physically unlock that gun. 
um, biometric locks on this outside of the safe that you're storing your weapons in are also great. Um, so that's another thing that New York just did, but we don't. Not every state has that. Actually, very few states have that. Yeah, you think that's a no-brainer, you know, to have a safe storage bill. I, I can tell you that the um, second leading cause of death of children and teens in this country is um, by guns. So that tells you something right there. And two thirds of all gun deaths are suicides. So that's another, and as Aaron said, what we've learned just being educated more about the issue of suicide is that it is an impulsive act and that it doesn't mean because someone had that impulse at one point, they're gonna do it again. So if you take away the means for them to really harm themselves, like having a gun accessible, the chances are you take some pills or something, you can be saved. You're not, you're not as, the chances of being saved if you shoot yourself with a gun is, is much, is not very good statistic. Uh, so, yes, uh, two thirds uh, talk, expanding on suicide uh, is then also uh, every single day on average 20 veterans uh, commit suicide and 11 of those are with a gun. So that's also something to keep in mind is that uh, there's a high rate of suicide among our veterans and uh, just to reach out to them as well. So this also goes into the red flag law is that uh, if you are somebody who may cause um, or is uh, possibly going to cause harm to somebody else or to yourself, then someone will intervene uh, smartly to remove the gun. And it's not on a permanent basis, and it's not about fear and uh, all these other issues that came up during the, meet, during the film that uh, are these quick little sound bites that the NRA feeds its members. It's basically a methodical process where people are investigated, uh, and that sounds kind of harsh, but just to kind of, to understand and appreciate whether this person really does cause or pose a harm to another person or to themselves. So again, methodical process. Uh, it's not a permanent removal of the gun, but it's just a good way to intervene on this. somebody is um, benefit. Time for one more question and then final remarks from our panelists. Only because I'm not. Uh, the only thing that, that, that bothers, well, not the only thing, but one thing is that we're talking about people who, who we think are in some way liable to harm somebody and have a gun. But it seems to me, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that most gun violence is actually done by very, quote, normal people because they're angry at something and they get upset and they have an argument with someone and they fight in the, in, in, in the parking lot or the theater or whatever it was or with their husbands and, 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 and wives and they happen to have a gun on them and use it. And just for those moments, just what you're talking about suicide victims as well, in those moments, if they have one, you know, it's that emotion at the time. And I, I remember working in, in the city and having a guy almost run me over. And I gave him the finger and he stopped his car and he almost got out. And I'm thinking, this is why I don't have a gun. And I will never have one because these situations in the city especially, but anywhere, can happen to us. And there are moments in our lives where if we had one, you know, otherwise not using it, but in those moments we, we may. And so confronting that situation is how very normal people at times in their lives, if they had a gun on them, may use it. And that's where I'm asking you, I guess the question is, is that where most of the actual homicides occur by very normal people and very unnormal moments? I just want to piggyback on that because this is the last question, but I hear a lot about this, we all hear a lot about this being an issue of mental illness, not an issue of gun ownership, and I think that ties in pretty directly to that. Is that really the case or is it just an ordinary person that there's actually stronger evidence that um, people with mental illness are more likely to be victims of gun violence themselves and some traitors. That's the facts. Uh, the mental health argument is a bait and switch tactic used yeah. by the NRA, specifically to change the subject. Well, of well, and also just to add to that, so mental illness is not more prevalent in this country than right. other countries, right? And the gun violence is 25 times that of other countries. So, you know, it's not a mental illness. I, I don't. I don't know the answer to that question. I don't have those. Statistics. May I have your attention, please. The library will be closing in ten minutes. Desk now. The library will be open tomorrow from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Thank you, and have a good evening.
But um, certainly in a number of the more publicized mass shootings, there's a lot, of, you know, Sandy Hook, all of these. These are people that had a problem, you know, mentally, in some way, shape, or form, or were angry, or just exhibiting behavior. This goes to the red flag law, which, you know, is something that put in place so that you, a family member, or a law enforcement, or I think in some cases in New York State, you can actually, I think teachers can do this, um, physicians can say, this person could be a, a danger. We, they should not be, have access to guns. And they can petition the courts temporarily take them away. It actually was just used in New York. It was just the first case uh, went through with that. So it's an important law. And also, the one more comment, the gentleman that was in the film, and he said that, I always have a gun, and I, I feel less safe. Well, the more guns that are out there, the less safe we really are. So uh, if you have one, you're likely going to use one. So that's the other. Well, you know, one more quick thing on that is, um, so that, that argument, you know, oh, you know, good guy with a gun, we need more guns. Well, we have a ton of guns. You saw how many guns we have, and it's not making us safer. So I don't think that really works. And I just wanted to say, um, only 3% of shootings are mass shootings. Yeah. So yes, the majority of shootings, 60% of, of, of gun deaths are suicides. Um, a large chunk are domestic violence. There's a statistic that um, the presence of a gun in a domestic violence situation increases the risk of death by 500%. Um, so I just want to say thank you to all of you for being part of this conversation, for joining us here this evening. I hope you'll join us again on December 12th when we, we uh, view the next film and invite um, particularly any, anyone you know who has uh, young people in their family or who works with young people. It'll be particularly apropos for them. Um, and uh, I found this on the floor. It's part of somebody's computer. It fell out of the side. If you have a mouse that needs one of these little things that sticks in it. Oh, okay, so they're all over the place. Okay, so there's a thing going on. We'll tell the library. Okay, um, and uh, I also want to remind you, when you leave the library, you can still become a friend of the series. If you see the beautifully decorated box with the butterflies on it, there's little handmade envelopes on it. Give us your name and your email address and any donation, and we'd be happy to put your name up in lights like so many of the other terrific friends of the series. And um, with that, I will give, just if you have a final comment from our panelists. Kind of depressing, so 34,855, the number of gun violence deaths. Uh, we started out with 52, and now we're up to 55. So just to let you know, uh, the last number, 917-497-1725. Please text me. I'll help you get involved. And if you want to join our organization, we have a um, sign-up sheet out there, but you can also text READY to 64433. That will take you right to our page. And... Um, you can join Moms to Man Action. We'd love to have you and participate in the types of activities we do, as well as both of these other organizations, which are equally terrific. Um, and if any of you have school-age children, um, high school, college-aged, um, who are interested in also joining the fight against gun violence, please send them my way. I have a sign-up sheet outside. Um, and yeah, please get involved. Terrific. We're going to ask the panelists to stick with us to take a, a picture with the group afterwards. But um, as everybody uh, is departing, please give a round of applause and thank you for our first The library really, really, really does like to kick us out before 9 o'clock. So. Yes, yes. And, uh, and grab some of the information from these organizations on your way out, please.